Johnson, and uh, I'm part of the reason that Chad is not here tonight, because Chad is in Kenya with a group of 16 people from your church. Yes, you can clap for that. That's awesome. He is there speaking to IMB missionaries on the field, leading people to Christ and uh, reaching people that have not been reached for the, with the gospel, and your team is there. Your team is there taking care of the missionary children that are there for that meeting. This is a, a very crucial time for those missionaries, and your pastor is speaking into their lives, and your volunteers taking care of their kids. It's really a blessing that they are there, and you're a big part of that. You're a big part of that because they came from here, you made it possible, and, uh, and you've sent them off. So I'm really thrilled to be here tonight. I want to say thank you you to Pastor Chad for allowing me to come and uh, fill in while he is gone, but also to you as a church, because you're such a generous church, giving to missions, giving to uh, the, the causes around this community like you did with Serve Our Schools, uh, giving to, um, to wells in Africa. You've given thousands of dollars to help provide wells in villages where there are no clean water, and when those wells go in, churches are planted, and we're counting all of those wells now, about 30 wells that have been brought, uh, that have been put in villages because of your generous giving. So thank you for that. God bless you for that. Yeah. I just got an email from uh, one of our missionaries just recently talking about an uh, area where they uh, have put in wells, and then now they're moving from there all the way to the coast, and they're using the funds that Calvary Church gave to make that possible. And every one of those places will have a church planted, a gospel witness, and clean water for children and families uh, in those villages. So uh, it's an awesome thing. Um, I have a, a little bit of a news flash for you tonight. And I, I don't want to discourage you. I don't want you to be upset about this. But Christians don't agree on everything. <laughs> Did you know that? Christians disagree sometimes. We don't always have the same opinions and, and beliefs about things. And sometimes you may be sitting right next to somebody in church that you might disagree with. So help me out here. What are some things that Christians might disagree about? This section over here, give me an answer. Politics, all right? You might be sitting next to someone who votes differently than you. <laughs> well, you might. All right, this section right here, what, what's something else that Christians might disagree about? Coffee. Coffee, there you go. That is a good one. Different kinds of coffee, decaf, regular um, all of that. Okay, very good. This section right here, what are something, what's something that Christians disagree about? Music. Okay. Lots of churches have that kind of dichotomy within the church, and, and it's not just a style kind of issue. There's also volume. There's, there's all kinds of things related to, uh, to music. We have a couple of churches that's, that sing and worship in different languages, you know, English and Romanian or English and Spanish, and so sometimes that becomes an issue. So, Music. Okay, this section over here. What's something that Christians disagree about? Football. <laughs> I get that. Theology. The theology of football. Okay. Okay. Um, got a girl here right, right on the third row. She's wearing a Dodger shirt. I'm going to try to. I'm going to try to not preach to her, but I. I, I just. It's going to be hard. Okay. Dodgers. Christians disagree about the Dodgers. Yeah, it happens. Yeah, there you go. All right. Do you know Christians even disagree about translations of the Bible? So you're using the English Standard Version. There are other churches that use different versions of the Bible. And all of these areas sometimes cause Christians to argue. And sometimes it gets ugly. And it's not becoming to the cause of Christ. It's not, it's not pretty. And so Paul gives us some instruction in Romans chapter 14 about what to do when Christians disagree. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to that passage, or if you can turn on your Bibles in your tablet or your phone. If you're using one of the Bibles that's provided there in the seat, it's on page 1127. It's Romans chapter 14. Let me set this up just a little bit. Because I know you guys have been making your way through the book of Romans. All right, Romans is a clear presentation 
of the gospel. What is the good news about Jesus Christ? And so Paul begins in the very first chapter saying, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. Now I want you to remember that little phrase, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. Because then he proceeds in presenting this, this kind of understanding of what the gospel is. And the first thing he establishes is that, that all people have sinned, that we're all sold under sin, that because of that sin we're separated from God and we're under the penalty of death. And that consequence will, will uh, end up in us being separated from God forever. Whether you are Jew or Gentile, whether you are religious or non-religious, no matter what's your background, nationality, where you come from, every person on the face of the planet, he establishes that very clearly have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But then he talks about God's provision. Starting in chapter 3, but God, who is rich in mercy, showed his grace to us by sending his son, Jesus Christ, who became the atoning sacrifice for our sins, the, the propitiation, he says, the atoning sacrifice so that our sins might be paid for so that we might be made right with God. The righteousness of God, justified before him. Justified means to be declared not guilty anymore. That's God's provision for us in Christ. And now, whether you are Jew or Gentile, wherever you're from, whatever your race, nationality, wherever wherever you are, whoever you are, you can place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, receive what he did for you on the cross by paying the penalty for your sin, and be made right with God. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And he concludes that by saying that if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, Jew or Gentile. Now I use those two words kind of, inter- kind of uh, together But what it means is that Paul was talking to people from his own racial background. They were Jews. They were from Israel, descendants of Abraham. But the rest of the world was described as Gentile. They were the non-Jewish people. That's all the rest of the people on the planet. And so what he's saying is that no matter who you are, where you come from, salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ, and now God has opened that up for everyone. All right, that's the good news. But it's complicated. And it's complicated now because all Jews and Gentiles have come in together into this body of Christ, into this this church. And so in Romans 12, a passage you guys have already looked at, Paul says, so we being many are, are now one in Christ Jesus. We've come into the same body. That means we carry all of that baggage with us, all of that background no matter where we come from, no matter what we, uh, where we, we are, what our background is, we bring that in, and that creates a clash of cultures. So within the body of Christ, you have all of this diversity, and that means that you're not going to agree on everything. So in this passage, Paul starts talking about how do you deal with that? What do you do with that? He's already made some comments in Romans 12. He says that you're to love one another with brotherly affection, giving preference or honor to each other. In other words, give a lot of grace. And in Romans 13, he says, love your neighbor as yourself. He said that sums up the entire law because love does no harm to a neighbor. But now in Romans 14, he's going to deal with some specific issues. But it's beautiful what Paul does because while he names three specific issues I'm going to tell you about, Three specific issues, he doesn't take sides or spend time talking about who's right and what's wrong. Instead, he gives us principles. Principles that can be applied anytime, anywhere, in any culture so that we can know what to do when Christians disagree. Romans chapter 14, I'll start reading in verse 1. I'm just going to read down the first three verses, and we're going to walk through this chapter together. Romans 14, 1, it says this, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only only vegetables. 
Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Now, the first issue Paul talks about is the eating of meat. And there was disagreement about this because in the Jewish faith, there were certain kinds of meat that should not be eaten. And in the Gentile world, it was common to take meat and offer it to idols and then sell that meat in the marketplace. And so whether it was meat that was offered to idols or whether it was unclean meat that would not have been allowed for the Jewish person because of the Old Testament law, Paul says it shouldn't make any difference. You, you, you have to accept each other even though you may have different perspectives about that issue. Now the word he uses for welcome means to accept the presence of a person with friendliness. Not pretense, not being superficially sweet, but to accept the presence of a person with friendliness. Another meaning of that word is to receive them as a guest. Now, when you have a guest in your home, you, you welcome them into your home. You don't say, hey, by the way, we're having hot dogs for dinner. Is that all right? You don't pick a fight. You receive them as a guest. And in our home, we, we want to be very aware. Do they, do they have any particular food sensitivities or allergies? Or is there something that they don't eat or they, they do eat? We want to know that up front because we want to make sure we receive them well as a guest. And that's the way Paul says we should treat one another. And he says, without quarreling, without arguing, because here's what happens often. What happens often is, as you're discussing something like this with a person, and they say, well, you know what, I don't believe in doing that, or I don't believe in eating meat. Well, why do you do that? We, we instantly start going into this argumentation. We want to find out why they believe that, and then we want to try to convince them that we're right and they're wrong. Paul says, don't do that. He said, accept each other without arguing. Accept without arguing. Now, that's hard to do because sometimes we think the perspective of another person really isn't, it doesn't make sense. But the word that Paul uses there for welcome is used again in verse 3 that I read just a moment ago because he says, let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats for God has welcomed him. A little bit later in chapter 15, verse 7, I'm not going to jump on Robert's passage for next Sunday, but here, here's what it says. It says, therefore, welcome one another. That's that same word. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. So we should offer the same kind of grace, the same kind of acceptance to someone else that has been afforded to us by Christ. Accept without arguing. Don't try to win them over to your perspective. Don't try to prove that they're wrong and you're right. Now, we're not, we're not talking about the kind of issues that, that, that might be essential to faith. The early church fathers used to call these non-essentials. That means they're, they're not essential to salvation and they're not essential to faith. We're not talking about differences of right or wrong. We're talking about opinions. We're talking about values. We're talking about cultural issues that that sometimes we may have clashes about when we come into the same body, the same church. Because we come into this together. Max Lucado, in, in his little book, In the Grip of Grace, his, his book on Romans, has a parable called Life Aboard the Fellowship. It, it's such a neat little story. He, he talks about how everyone who is on this, he, he compares the church to a, to a ship. He says it's not a cruise ship, it's a battleship. We have a mission. So, so everybody that's on the ship has a, has a job. Some people are rescuing people who are, who are still overboard. Some, some of them are feeding the crew. Some of them are, are, are cleaning the boat. Some of them are, are, are taking care of other responsibilities. But everybody on the boat is there because they've been invited to come aboard by the captain. And they all have a relationship with the captain. And when they come on board, they notice that they're not the only ones. There's some other people there, and some of them don't even wear the same kind of uniform. And they have differences. Oh, they have differences. There's some people that feel like serving the captain is serious business. So they get up early every morning, and they have a study in a part of the boat they call the stern because they're very serious. 
Other people feel like the most important thing about serving the captain is prayer. And so they gather every day and they kneel in the bow of the boat. Some people feel like that using real wine in the Lord's Supper is the most important thing, so they gather on the port side. Yeah. And there's all these different opinions. Even, even the day that, that they read the words of the captain and they sing praises to him, they, they have disagreement about it. Some want it to be very quiet so they can meditate. Others want it to be very loud so they can celebrate. But we're all on this boat together. So how do we do that? How do we do that? We begin by accepting without arguing. But then Paul gives us three more principles in this passage that are so great to help us to understand how we should relate to one another when we disagree. Look at verse 4 in this passage. He says, Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the, observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then... Whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself. To God. First principle that follows that is Paul says, live for the Lord without judging. Live for the Lord without judging. Now he brings up this matter of, of observing special days. And you can imagine in a church where there were people that came out of a Jewish background and people that came out of a non-Jewish or completely Gentile or pagan background, you would have this kind of controversy. Those that were Jews had days that they regarded as sacred, the Sabbath. The Day of Atonement, the Passover, Pentecost, those were days that were connected to their faith. They were connected to their family. They had traditions, rich traditions. And when they became Christians, they brought those traditions with them. And then they said, you know, Jesus really helps us to understand what these traditions are really all about. You should all observe these days. They're, they're great days. It wasn't easy for them to just say, oh, they don't have any meaning anymore. They had deep faith for them, deep meaning for them. And, and Gentiles that came into the church, they heard about those days, they read about those days, understood that they had some connection, but, but they had no idea. They, they were raised completely without that. So Paul says, what do you do about that? What do you do about these special days? Well, he says, if they observe the day, they observe it in honor of the Lord. And if they don't observe it, then they don't observe it in honor of the Lord. We have to live for the Lord, he says. Now, we haven't come that much further. I mean, we have special days that people celebrate, they observe. Other people don't observe those same days. I mean, this past week, we had a holiday called Columbus Day. Some people observed it. Some people protested it. Some of those people are Christians. We may not agree on that day. We have other days that we celebrate, and not everybody agrees on those days. So what do you do? Well, if you celebrate it, you celebrate it for the Lord. If you don't, you don't for the Lord. But Paul says all of us have this responsibility. We're to live for the Lord because we belong to the Lord. So whether we celebrate it or don't celebrate it, we should do it in honor of the Lord. Live for the Lord. And here's the most important part. And don't judge. Live for the Lord without judging. Because we're all going to give an account to God. It's not for us to judge. It's God's responsibility to judge. He's the only one that can really say. 
And the person that you disagree with is going to give an answer to God for what they do or what they don't do. And guess what? So are you. So you have to keep your eyes on Jesus. Our job is to follow Jesus. Not try to tell everybody else how to follow Jesus. And if we'll live for the Lord without judging, then we'll be ready to stand before God and give an account of our own selves. Do you remember when Jesus was talking to Peter after the resurrection? He met them on the, on the shore that day. He was cooking breakfast for them. I love that about Jesus. He cooks breakfast. It's awesome. And they were out there in the boat, and they understood it was Jesus, and Peter just jumps in the boat, swims over to shore. And after breakfast, Jesus and Peter have this discussion. You remember this? Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? Three different times. Jesus said, Lord, you, you know I love you. And each time, Jesus said, well, then feed my sheep or feed my lambs, feed my sheep. And he told Peter, he said, Peter, someday you're going to be taken where you don't want to go. And things are going to happen to you that you don't want to happen, but follow me. Now, Peter, you know, he's, he's looking around. You know, when Jesus is speaking directly to you, you're like, whoo. He looked around, and he, there's John. What about him? What, what's he going to do? Jesus said, what my plan is for him is none of your business. You follow me. Those are some of the best words in the Bible. Because sometimes we want to say, Lord, what about that person? Why, why are they doing that? Or why do they not do that? But our job is not to look at other people. Our job is to keep our eyes on Jesus and follow him. Live for the Lord without judging others. Now, the next principle is also very important, and that is to use freedom without harming. Use freedom with har without harming. Verse 13, Therefore, he says, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. Do you hear what Paul is saying? Look, if, if there's something that your brother or sister disagrees with, and, and, and by you doing that, it's going to cause them harm. Paul says, don't do that. It, it's not about whether you have the freedom to do it or not. Yeah, we have freedom. We have freedom in Christ. How do I know that? He says, I am assured in Christ that all foods are clean. That's because Jesus said, it's not what goes into a man, but what comes out of a man that causes him to be unclean. Because it's out of the heart and out of the mouth that come all of the blasphemies and, 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 uh, dis and deception, all the things that, uh, that create sin. And Peter had this dream about these animals that came down from heaven. And, and the, the Lord said to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. It's all clean. And Paul has, has been very clear about our freedom in Christ. But being free in Christ doesn't mean that you are free to hurt someone else. Let's say I were to go into a Celebrate Recovery group. I go into the meeting and I said, hey, guys, I got great news. We're free. I brought a case of beer. Yeah, not very good. Because it would be harming my brothers. Harming them because they're working through overcoming an addiction. And my freedom would cause them harm. Paul says, use your freedom without harming. Don't harm someone else by what you do. Don't cause another brother to stumble. These words hit me really hard, and I'll tell you why. Jesus, when he was talking about causing someone else to stumble, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, if you do something that causes one of my little ones to stumble, it'd be better for you that a millstone was cast around your neck and you to be put into the sea. That's serious business. I don't want to be wearing a millstone. I want to make sure I'm using my freedom in a way that honors God glorifies him and causes no one else to stumble it's not about what you're free to do it's about what others might be affected by what you do you know, I, had a, I had a youth minister one time that 
And, you know, pastors always tell stories about youth ministers. It seems like that's where all the problems always start. Um, <laughs> and, and this youth minister did something that a lot of, a lot of people do. He always wore his ball cap uh, into church and wore his ball cap sometimes, and he would make announcements. And I had an elderly gentleman in my church, and he said, you know, he said, I know I'm old-fashioned. I know nobody thinks this way, but it really bothers me. I just, I just don't think he should be wearing this ball cap that way. So I sat down with this young man, and I said, hey, look, this, this guy has asked this question, and I, I want you to know this is causing him to have some, some difficulty. It's causing him to struggle when he's in church. So, you know, if you can, just don't wear the ball cap. He says, I'm free in Christ. I can wear this ball cap. Nobody can tell me I can't wear the ball cap. I said, well, I'm not telling you that Christ is saying you can't wear the ball cap. I'm telling you it's causing a brother to stumble in his faith, and you can call him weak if you want to. But the truth is, we want to love our brother, and we want to do everything we can to build him up. And that brings me to the last point. The last point is to build up without tearing down. Build up without tearing down. Look at these last few verses. Verse 16, So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. Do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything indeed is clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have keep between you and yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does, does not proceed from faith, is sin. Hear what he says. He says, do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. What is the work of God? The work of God is the changing, transforming that's taking place in a person's life through Jesus Christ. That's what this church is about. It's about changed lives. And those lives are being changed by the power of Christ. And so what he says is, build up without tearing down. You build one another up in the faith. You encourage them. You encourage them by living together for Christ and showing the love of Christ. Why is this such a big deal? I mean, it, is, it, is it just about having a church where everybody's nice? I mean, is it, is it just about not offending people? What is this really about? I want to close this sermon by reading some words from John chapter 17. John chapter 17, Jesus is praying for his disciples and for all of those who will believe through their word, that's us. And he prays for something very specific. Here's what he says. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus prayed that we would be one. He prayed for his disciples to be unified together. The reason why is because he knew those guys argued about everything. They, they disagreed about all kinds of stuff. They argued about who was, who was most important, what they were going to have for lunch. I mean, they had all kinds of arguments. Jesus prayed that they would be one. And he prayed that all of those who would believe as a result of their witness would also be one. And the reason why is he says, so that... The world may believe that you sent me because Jesus knew that there was nothing more disruptive to the gospel message and the gospel witness than disunity, division, quarreling. Our unity is a witness for Christ. So he wants us to be one even when we disagree. And, and the only way that's going to happen is if we accept without arguing we live for the Lord without judging. We, we use freedom without harming. And we build up rather than tear down. Let's pray.